Thank you for this fantastic turnout tonight. Absolutely wonderful. Um, you never know until the night just how many people are going to come to these things. And I think the sheer volume of people who have come tonight says a lot. So thank you to everyone who's come along and who knows about UKIP. Thank you even more, if I may say so, to those of you who come along with an open mind. Tonight is all about what UKIP can offer as a realistic alternative. Nigel's going to come on stage a little bit later. He's going to give us a speech followed by a question and answer. Any questions at all, he's happy to deal with. This is a night where I don't want anyone to go away from this venue with any unanswered questions. UKIP is here in this area in a big way and we want to make a difference and we want to show you that we are at the very least sincere. So you may have noticed there's a raffle being going round. I hope everyone's got your tickets. Please, please do. Uh, these venues aren't cheap. So if you could, that would be wonderful. After Nigel's done his speech, the chairman of Dudley and Halzo and UKIP, Phil Wimblett, is going to come up onto the stage, draw the raffle, say a few parting words, and hopefully we'll have a, a happy winner of a nice television. But before Nigel starts speaking, he talks about the national and international issues of UKIP and also face the country today. As the local guy in this area, I'm the council candidate in Sedgley and the PPC, prospective parliamentary candidate for Dudley North. My name is Bill Etheridge. At any time in the future, if anyone wants to get in touch or ask questions about UKIP, please feel free to contact me or any of my other colleagues who are here tonight who've got their rosettes on. We care about this area and it's not just about the issues you might associate with UKIP. Welcome to Dudley. What a great place. People from outside Dudley may not think that, but I can tell you we've got a castle, we've got a zoo, we've got the Black Country Museum, we've got some great pubs with some really good real ale, we've got Sedgley Beacon, <laughs> renowned for good fossil hunting, where my dad used to take me when I was a kid and we used to catch some good fossils. This is a great area. The people in it are great people. We are proud of the black country and where we come from. Very proud. But you may not think that from the way this area has been run and let down by politicians. In recent times in Dudley, we've had a Conservative run council. Recently that changed. But that Conservative council showed all the dynamism, enthusiasm and radical ideas of the fossils that me and my dad used to hunt at the Beacon. <laughs> the problems that we face in this area are not going to be changed by calling Dudley a city. The problems you could call Wolves Chelsea. We're not going to win the Champions League. It's not about the name, it's about practical measures to make a difference. And what's more, it's about listening to the local people. So when you come in your droves and say, I'd love to get to the shops, but I can't park. And when I do park, it's exorbitant parking fees. And by the way, why should I shop in Dudley when there's a great big free car park at a place called Merry Hill up the road? These are issues that are practical, common sense things that we try to deal with in UK. We've got an open air, we've spoken to local businesses. One of the things that they've said is that they're concerned that school leavers don't always have the right skills to, to begin work as soon as they leave school. We've got a plan that we'd like to coordinate and liaise with local business so that they know in schools what the local businesses are looking for. Let's talk to each other. This isn't rocket science, this is nothing special, but it's common sense. Something that's dreadfully lacking around not just this area, but the whole of our country. And then you look at the larger scale of things. We've got a Labour MP in this area. Well, this gentleman, I use the term loosely, <laughs> is a man who doesn't like to engage in debate or conversation. In fact, Nigel today has been down to Downing Street where he handed in a letter demanding that David Cameron debate with him on Europe. <laughs> Mr Cameron, I think it's safe to say I'll probably go to ground. Not so long ago, BBC Radio invited 
our local MP Ian Austin to debate with me live on air about some of the slurs and slanders and vile things that he said about UKIP. He's gone to ground as well. He doesn't want to face us, he doesn't want to talk to us. What he wants to do is stand from afar and call names. Well, I think the people of this area are intelligent enough, wise enough, savvy enough to see through that. Take us for what we are, not what people call us. Especially from a guy who David Cameron called a brown-eyed boot boy. Well, it's unusual for David Cameron to call nasty names to anyone except Eurosceptic Conservatives, isn't it? So he must be a bad egg. So I set the scene with our local setup, and you've got outside, you've got my wife on the table with other volunteers. If you want more information, if you want to join us, we would be delighted to have you along, all of you. Help us change the face of politics in this area. Help us to have a group of politicians helping to run Dudley who listen, who take notice of what the people say, who aren't remote, who don't just come out at election time, but are here all the time. We're never hard to find. We, us and UKIP, are here to talk at any time. So having made that appeal, and given the local background, just so you know that we're not all about some of the bigger issues that are going to be discussed tonight, I want to welcome onto the stage a gentleman who I think it's safe to say is one of the most charismatic and exciting speakers in politics today. A gentleman who, a couple of weeks ago in London, I actually had to follow to speak. Now, there's an old saying, after the Lord Mayor's show, I don't know if you know what comes after that. But that's how I felt. But it was great to actually be talking at the same time as a man who made so much sense, spoke with so much passion, and wasn't afraid to actually say what he thought. There's no political correctness here. There's just honesty and straight talking. If you don't agree or don't like what's said, talk to us. Talk to Nigel, he's here to talk. But most importantly of all, just bear in mind the fact that tonight you're in a place where the politics of honesty and genuine people is. So feel free, open your mouths, shout up. Now, I'd like to give, I'm very, very proud to welcome to my hometown of Sedgley, in the black country, I'd like to welcome the leader of UKIP, and I think a man who's gonna make a real difference in the British political scene. I'd like to welcome Nigel Farage. Congratulations to you and the rest of your team for putting in the legwork to make this meeting a success. It's terrific to see so many people here. And the really encouraging thing is, it doesn't matter where I go, whether it's the north, the south, the east, the west, the midlands, all over the country now, people are turning out at UKIP meetings in real numbers. And this is a time when the other parties say that the public meeting is dead. They don't hold public meetings. They think they can govern, they can get our votes simply through sound bites and spin at election time. Well, we don't do that, and you're all welcome here. Whether you've come in here to agree with us, whether you've come in here to disagree with us, you'll get your chance to have a say. And it's gratifying for me because I've been doing this for some time. I was elected to the European Parliament way back in 1999. I can scarcely believe it, really. And in those days, we were considered a bit of a joke and written off. And we were denounced as being eccentrics, cranks, gadflies, fruitcakes, <laughs> loonies, extremists. I mean, any form of abuse um, that the three traditional parties could find, they threw at us. And now we find ourselves not only above the Liberal Democrats in the opinion polls, but we also find the central aim of this party, namely that the best people to govern Britain are the British people themselves, and that we can't do that as members of this political union in Brussels, we now find that is a settled mainstream majority view in this country. So I'm proud of the years of hard slog that we've put in, and I'm proud of the fact that we and our views have now become mainstream, 
In fact, it all reminds me of that story that Bob Monkhouse used to tell. Bob Monkhouse used to say, when I was growing up, I told my friends and family, when I was older, I was going to become a comedian. And they laughed at me. <laughs> well, he said later on, they're not laughing now, are they? <laughs> and it does feel a bit like that for you, Kip. And as Bill said, I, um, I trudged up number 10 Downing Street today with my letter challenging Mr Cameron. Because I've got to tell you, I'm not very happy with Mr Cameron. In fact, I'm not very happy with any of them. Because what we keep doing, time and again, in an effort to kick into the long grass, this key constitutional question is they keep promising us a referendum. The Lib Dems, ever since Paddy Ashdown 20 years ago, keep promising a referendum, and then when it comes to a vote in the House of Commons or the House of Lords, they vote the other way. Labour, of course, kept promising a referendum as a means of not having a debate on Europe, um, and since 97, till they fell out of office in 2010, no referendum was given to us. But there were some who thought that it might be different with David Cameron and the Conservatives. Sorry, Nigel, they said. We agree with everything you say, but we feel so badly let down by Labour that we've got to vote Conservative. And anyway, they used to say, just you wait till David gets in. You'll see. You'll see what a good patriotic, Eurosceptic, Conservative leader he is. Well, it was Mr Cameron that made us a cast iron guarantee. Do you remember that? Yes. You're all sun readers, obviously, <laughs> um, because that's where he made the promise. Cameron made that pledge, and indeed, they won the Euro elections of 2009, campaigning on that ticket. But now that he's Prime Minister, he says, well, there's a possibility we might have a referendum, but of course the time is not yet right. But if that wasn't bad enough, he goes further. And he says, even when we do have a referendum, it won't be an in-out question on our membership of the European Union. And then just to compound that, he finishes up by saying that the reason we mustn't have an in-out referendum is because he believes it's in our interests to stay a member of the Union. So what he's saying is, damn you, I couldn't care less what you think, I've made my mind up and I'm not even going to give you the opportunity. So that's what today's letter was about. And my letter to Cameron is to challenge him. Would he come on a platform here or anywhere else and let him tell us what he thinks the benefits of EU membership are? And I'm quite prepared to provide the counter arguments. I suspect I'm going to get no answer at all. He appears, along with Miliband and Clegg, to be absolutely committed to our continued membership of a union, which is costing us a membership fee of £51 million a day, money that we would argue would be rather better spent in this country. He wants us stuck. He wants us stuck in a union that makes for us now 3,000 new laws every year. And we would argue that much of that regulation, be it on employment, be it on health and safety, be it on the environment, is actually damaging Britain's entrepreneurs. And I'm particularly thinking here about the 4.2 million people, small businessmen, small businessmen and women and sole traders. They can't cope with the cost of all of this stuff. And with employment regulations where they are, they're all frightened of taking on a school leaver. So we see that as being another deleterious cost. But perhaps the other big cost of being part of this thing, and the fact that very few people know, I love the ringtone, by the way. <laughs> it won't be the last tonight, it never is. <laughs> One of the other great costs of this that nobody understands is when we voted to remain part of a common market, nobody explained to us that it was actually a customs union, a very, very old-fashioned 19th century concept. And what it meant was that not just were we bound by the rules of the club, but that we, as the world's fifth biggest trading nation, are forbidden from making our own trade deals, our own bilateral free trade deals, with any other part of the world. Now that to us is madness. Because one thing we would say in UKIP is, there's a group of countries out there, you know, that speak English, that have common law, that have 
the same accounting systems that we have. There's a group of countries out there that now make up 28% of the world's population. And they're people who, when we're in trouble, come and stand shoulder to shoulder with us. In many cases, they're our own kith and kin. We have a broader, wider family in this world. And the sooner we cut our ties of customs union and political union with the EU, have a simple free trade agreement with them, and re-embrace that exciting part of the world called the Commonwealth, the better. Yeah. But I must say something about what is happening across in Europe. Now, one or two of you may have seen on YouTube, from time to time, my helpful and constructive comments <laughs> from within the European Parliament. It's often got me into quite a lot of trouble, but frankly, that doesn't matter because I don't really care. <laughs> then I might share the story with you. So, when we had this Constitutional Treaty of Europe, if you remember, the French and the Dutch voted it down. And that should have been the end of the EU Constitution, but this dishonest, ghastly bunch of people rebranded it as the Lisbon Treaty, thinking that the good thing was it wouldn't get put to any referendum and it would go through. Well, of course, the Irish did say no, but were then forced to vote again. And one of the provisions of this treaty is that it would create a new president of Europe, a president of 500 million people. And we were told that the first president of Europe would be such a major, significant international figure. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> that he would stop the traffic in Washington and Beijing. Well, you know what happened. And the day of his acceptance speech, this little chap turned up with very scruffy hair, plastic injection moulded shoes, and a suit and tie combination that, I mean, frankly, you'd have done better down at the local pound shop, but there we are. And what I said was, I said we were promised a giant global figure. We were promised a man that would stop the traffic in Washington and Beijing, and sadly, sir, what we got was you. <laughs> I said, I don't wish to be rude, but, now of course you know when someone says that, <laughs> that they may be. I don't wish to be rude, but you have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank club. And the question that I want to know, the question we all want to know, is who are you? I've never heard of you, nobody else has ever heard of you. Now it was like a sort of hand grenade going off inside this parliament. But folks, if you think about the great parliamentary tradition, if you think about what happens in Westminster every Wednesday in Prime Minister's questions, I think it's very difficult to argue that I'd stepped over any line. You know, I'd teased the bloke a little bit, but that was as far as it went. Well, that afternoon, the President of the Parliament invited me to go and meet him. Now, wasn't that nice of him? <laughs> and would I appear at his office at nine o'clock the next morning. So I turned up and put the obligatory exercise book, you know, down the back of the trousers. <laughs> I'm just old enough to remember all that stuff. <laughs> and in I went. A piece of advice for any of you, if you're ever invited into a meeting and coffee's not offered, you're in for a rollicking, okay? <laughs> so no coffee was offered. And the President looked at me with this sort of very grave look. I thought, crikey, this is serious, you know. What have I done? He said, Mr Farage, he says, you have brought disgrace on the EU institutions. Yeah. To which I replied, well, I thought you'd been having a fairly good go yourselves, actually. <laughs> he said, I'm asking you to apologise. I want you to apologise to Mr Herman Van Rompuy. I want you to apologise to the European Parliament. And then the one that got me and I couldn't help myself, I had to start laughing. He said, I want you to apologise to the people of Belgium. Well, <laughs> I mean, it really was all too much. Anyway, he said, if you don't do this, we will levy upon you 
the maximum fine that we're allowed to as, as a European Parliament. I said, well, thank you, sir. I shall consider your offer. <clears throat> and out I went. And I opened the door. And, of course, there were all the press, you know, the flash cameras going. And they're all shouting, you know, are you going to apologise? Are you going to apologise? And, of course, they all thought that with the prospect of a big fine, that I would back down and, 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 and that I would issue this long list of apologies. And so I said, listen, guys, um, sometimes I think in life it's better to be a man, to admit you've got it wrong, um, and to wholeheartedly apologise. And so I now unconditionally apologise to bank clerks all over the world. <laughs> in case I'm But there is a very serious side to this, and it's this. The issue that motivated me from going from business, as I was for 20 years, into politics, was when Britain joined the exchange rate mechanism back in 1990. I thought then, this will never work, and of course within two years, what we saw were a million people on the unemployment register, unnecessarily, and some here may remember, record bankruptcies, record house repossessions, genuine misery, because we forced our interest rates up to try and keep the pound pegged with the Deutschmark. And so when the great Euro project was launched, I was delighted that we weren't a part of it, but what I've seen happening over this last decade has been nothing short of tragic. Just think, about the situation in Greece today. Greece should never have joined the Euro in the first place. She now finds herself with a youth unemployment rate of 57%. 30% of private companies in Greece have gone bankrupt since 2008. A quarter of the Greek population are now living officially below the poverty line. And it's not just the suicides that have gone up. Actually, in hundreds, perhaps even thousands of cases, people have actually left their children on the steps of the Greek Orthodox Church with notes around their neck saying, please take care of this child. We can't afford to feed him or her. This is the level that Greece is being uh, sent to. So is it any wonder that a few months ago there were 80,000 protesting Greeks trying to get into the Greek Parliament who had to be held back by 5,000 armed policemen. And the same tragedy is now beginning to unfold in Spain. I've no doubt the Portuguese aren't far behind. And the message, the answer, that I've tried to provide through speech after speech in the Parliament is that their bailout mechanism cannot work. It is simply pouring good money after bad. And that if we were genuinely good Europeans, as opposed to devotees of this political project, we would help those countries get their currency back, enjoy a competitive devaluation, get their democracies back, and get themselves back on the road to growth. <laughs> but that isn't what's happening. And indeed, I had a meeting last November with Chancellor Merkel. One of the odd things is that I'm one of the seven leaders of a group in the Parliament. So whether they like it or not, they have to invite me to all the official functions, which I've no doubt sticks in the craw a bit. But when I met Chancellor Merkel last November, oh, and incidentally, um, a private aside, I can assure you that Angela Merkel in private looks even more miserable than she looks in public. <laughs> When I sat down with Chancellor Merkel, I said, Chancellor, wouldn't it be better for your German taxpayers, who've just spent 20 years paying for the reintegration of Eastern Germany into Western Germany, wouldn't it be better for them not to ask them to sign blank checks in perpetuity to the Mediterranean zone? And wouldn't it be a liberation for the people of Greece to break out of this euro? But no, Mr Farage, she said. We can't do that, because if Greece leaves the Euro, other countries will leave the Euro, and that would be the end of our European dream. Well, well, yeah, yeah. well there is a bit of me that says I'll drink to that, of course. So when you think about it, what Merkel is saying, what Barroso is doing, what Van Rompuy is doing, and what David Cameron is doing, 
with the support of Nick Clegg and David Miliband, is they are saying everything must be done to preserve the euro. And so what's actually happening is we've got a situation now where they couldn't care less if tens of millions of people are forced into poverty, misery and desperation. They couldn't care less because their dream in the big project, in the big idea of a United States of Europe matters more. And frankly, I have reached the conclusion that this whole project is not just bad for Britain, it is bad for the continent as a whole. And I want us to fight for a Europe of individual, democratic, free nation states that trade together, cooperate together, act as good neighbours, and we can sign that flag, that anthem, the Parliament, the Commission, and the European Court to the dustbin of history. Well, I'm pleased to say. These arguments now have a resonance, not just in this country, but across the whole of the European continent too. But it is now, as a party that started off in its early years, as a siren, trying to wake the British people up as to what had been done in their name, it is now very important that UKIP performs a different role in UK politics. Whereas in the past, we just talked about who governs Britain, it is now beholden upon us to talk about how that Britain should be governed. Because we are going to get this referendum. And the stronger UKIP are, the quicker that referendum will come. But what we now have to do is to point the way ahead. And it's not just Europe, folks, is it, that's going wrong in this country. It's actually virtually everything. <coughs> Did you see the census figures produced today? Yes. The census figures showing the biggest increase in the UK population over the course of the last 10 years that this country has ever seen. <clears throat> the hidden figure, of course, is the BBC will tell you that over half has directly been caused by immigration, but actually that's not true. Because if you, if you include the children born to new migrants to Britain, it is actually certainly over two-thirds and probably nearer three-quarters. Now, I want to say this absolutely as clearly as I possibly can. I know that in some parts of this country there is still a residual prejudice against anybody that stands up and discusses the immigration issue. There is a feeling, apparently, that if you even discuss this, you are somehow pandering to racism, xenophobia, hatred and dislike. That is total and utter baloney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are a non-racist, non-sectarian political party. My biggest supporter in UKIP is the former black boxer Winston Mackenzie, who stood for us in the recent London elections. And all over Britain, we find members of the ethnic communities coming to UKIP, being welcomed into UKIP and taking ever more prominent roles. And I'll go further than that, we've actually in our constitution, and we're the only party in Britain that's done this, if you've ever been a member of an extreme right wing or left wing political organisation, we don't even want you as a member of our party. Mm. Alright, so we're clear where we stand on this. But we cannot, ladies and gentlemen, and we should not, allow the current migratory flow into Britain to continue the way that it is. Mm. I think there is something fundamentally wrong with the fact that if you come in tomorrow morning on the overnight coach from Warsaw, and you come into Victoria Station, and you go to the local government office, and you say, I'm self-employed, and I'm looking for help, you will get housing benefit within a fortnight. Now I'm sorry, but our view is this. Our view is the benefit system is there for British families that have in many cases paid into this system for generations. So we have to argue for something that is right and is just and is fair. You know, this government said it would cut immigration into Britain from hundreds of thousands a year to tens of thousands a year. The official figures for 2011 
are that 593,000 people settled in this country last year. If we carry on with this current rate, it will be an increase in the population of this country that is the equivalent to the eight largest cities in Britain outside London added up together. We have the biggest strain we've ever had on our, on our public resources and the answer must be that we must call a halt to mash up mass uncontrolled immigration into this country. Yes, we will pursue a sensible work permit system, a sensible immigration system, but we should model what we do in future on what Australia does by saying we want people to come who sign up to the British way of life, who swear an allegiance to our Queen and who have got a skill to bring to this country. And I want us, everybody else wants to duck away from this issue and not discuss it at all. And I want us to be the party offering a sensible, positive policy solution. Yeah. And at a time when unemployment is rising, growth is flatlining, even the U-turns won't improve the, the, the economy, I can assure you. But at a time when things are going badly, there is a hidden truth about something that is going on in the British economy that no other party dare touch. And this is the current obsession with CO2 emissions, the current green madness that has swept this country. Now again, let me put in a rider, a disclaimer. You know, I'm not advocating, we're not advocating that we should willfully go around and pollute the planet. Yes, of course we want to be responsible for future generations. But I have to say, it is seriously open to doubt whether CO2 emissions on their own are directly leading to global warming. In fact, since 1998, the temperature of the Earth hasn't increased at all. Now, I'm not saying as a party we should come out one way or the other on this debate, but I am saying that the science on this is not settled. But the desire of politicians, and in particular the desire of EU politicians, who've now tied us to a series of targets, their view a few years ago was that the majority of people were concerned, so they would do something, legislate, and they thought in that way, claim the benefit. We as a party are clearly, wholly, unequivocally opposed to the mass spread and development of wind turbines, both onshore and offshore, on these islands. They don't work, folks. They don't work. Because when you have peak demand for electricity, it tends to be in January and February. And what happens in January and February when you've got peak demand? Well, I'll tell you. You get a big, unlike this summer, you get a big anti-cyclone and it settles over the country. And you get fog and you get frost. But there's one thing that you don't get. You don't get any wind. So you have to have a hundred percent backup for the turbines that you've built. So, there's, so, so, so the net effect in terms of CO2 emissions is zero, but the worst of it is the way this project has been used to literally steal money from poor people and give it to rich people. Uh, honestly, every single, every single electricity consumer in Britain has a 15% surcharge. Hidden surcharge, but it's a surcharge on their electricity bill to pay for the renewables programme. And who are the beneficiaries of that renewables program? Well, I'll give you one example. David Cameron's father-in-law earns nearly a thousand pounds a day just for siting wind turbines on his land in North Lincolnshire. So we're seeing this crackpot project transferring money from the poor to the rich, despoiling our landscape and seascape, not reducing CO2 emissions, but it gets worse than that. It gets worse than that when we start to talk about industry, and in particular manufacturing industry. Now here you are, in the heart of what, until just a few years ago, really was the beating heart of manufacturing in the United Kingdom. 
the surcharge that every commercial company pays for its electricity use to pay for these renewable projects is now a staggering 21%. So when the local factory closes, don't be surprised because electricity prices have contributed to that. But it's worse than that for the big manufacturers. They have to comply with the European CO2 emissions trading scheme, where they're forced to reduce their outputs of CO, of CO2. So successful has this been that when Corus closed down last year in Redcar, they were paid 300 million sterling in carbon credits by you, the taxpayer, to close down because they produced less CO2 in the next three years. And then they announced the very next week they were transferring that production to plants in India. So it's the same story. It's a zero-sum game on CO2, whether that worries you or not, but we are literally paying to de-industrialise British manufacturing industry. And I want us to be the party that stands up unashamedly and fights for Britain's small, medium and large-sized businesses. And we can do that as a party of people that actually have worked in the real world before, unlike these idiotic college kids that are now running our country. Now there is so much more I could say, there is a whole manifesto uh, that I could talk about, but I hope I've given you a flavour of the kind of things that you will now see and hear UKIP campaigning about on a national and on a local issue. But I want to bring us back, if I can, to the main point. The main point is this, unless we win back what I believe to be our birthright, our ability to govern our own country through a parliamentary democracy, unless we win those powers back, then frankly, the rest of these conversations become irrelevant. Politics becomes dead. Because all we're doing now at general elections is we're voting for a change of management, not for a change of government. And we want to get that power and responsibility back. I am not promising you that we will immediately enter some golden age. I've no doubt we'll get British governments that make bad decisions. But the whole point about parliamentary democracy, folks, is when you get a government that makes a bad decision, you can sack them and replace them with somebody else. And there's nothing we can do to get rid of any single one of those European laws that now go into a series of books that are 120,000 pages of close type law. There's nothing we can do about it. So we've got to get back the freedom of this country. We've made great strides. We've shifted public opinion. We will, if this country, if, if, if this party goes on from strength to strength, force a national referendum on this issue. Give us the opportunity to win back our freedom and then give us the chance to start to put in place some of the pragmatic, common sense ideas that I hope you agree with me you've heard this evening. But it's no good, those of you that come along tonight and agree with what I have to say, please don't leave here and then go back and vote for people that do the opposite. Please don't do that. You know, your own tribal allegiance to the Labour Party or the Tory Party is as nothing compared to righting the great wrong that has been done to our country. We want to hand on to our children and grandchildren those freedoms that those that went before us actually went to the world in arms to defend at massive cost and sacrifice. Yeah. That is how much this means to us. We're not prepared to stand up and fight for what we believe in, we don't deserve to get it. And so I'm asking you, I'm asking you to commit, I'm asking you to help us, I'm asking you to join us, I'm asking you to do something. Now I want to know, can I have a little bit of an audience participation here? Can I see a show of hands, those people in the audience who are not members of UKIP, hands up. Oh, well, that's about 50-50. Right, can you lock the doors at the back? Uh, <laughs> you are the people that 
I'm appealing to more than anybody. We need your help. We're on the right track. We've, we've got a bit of momentum going with us. Come, please, and give us a hand. And let's change the face of British politics. Let's change the nature and the history of this country. We can do it. Are you with us? Yeah. Right.